Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Tonight's event highlights Muhammad Ali on the five-year anniversary of his passing. We are thrilled to welcome all of you as we partner with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA, which was founded by Carter G. Woodson in 1915. Having launched our partnership during Black History Month this year, we are thrilled to continue the collaboration to ensure that important voices are heard. Tonight's event is also offered in partnership with the Kega Foundation, which is dedicated to uplift and support the voices of diverse global communities by providing international communication platforms designed to improve the world through four high impact programming areas, dance and choreography training, global artistic cultural exchange, literacy and social justice. These collaborations mean a great deal to PBS Books. In addition, we would like to thank our library network partners, numerous PBS stations across the country, and most importantly, we'd like to thank you for joining us. Last month, it was announced that a new Ken Burns documentary film entitled Muhammad Ali will premiere between September 19th and the 22nd on PBS as a four-part eight-hour series exploring the life of the legendary boxer discussing sports, race, and culture. The film follows the life of one of the most consequential men of the 20th century, a three-time heavyweight boxing champion. At the height of his fame, Ali challenged Americans' racial prejudices, religious biases, and notions about the roles celebrities and athletes play in our society and inspired people all over the world with his message of pride and self-affirmation. Let's take a moment to watch a clip. He was bigger than boxing. I am the greatest. He was larger than life. His magnetism just was amazing. Who is this guy? He was a revolutionary. He was a groundbreaker. And ain't nobody gonna stop me. Ken Burns captures an intimate story of victory, defeat, and determination. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Muhammad Ali. Tune in or stream. Starts Sunday, September 19th at 8, 7 central, only on PBS. This evening, we are fortunate to have Ken Burns collaborator, filmmaker David McMahon with us. Thank you, Heather. David, uh, just a little bit about you because you are quite accomplished. David McMahon has been making award-winning documentary films for more than a decade. In addition to writing and co-directing Muhammad Ali with Sarah Burns, um, David has collaborated with Ken Burns and members of the Florentine film team um, on the 10th inning, Central Park Five, Jackie Robinson, and East Lake Meadows, a public housing story. We are so thrilled to have you here this evening to celebrate the life and legacy of Muhammad Ali. Welcome. Thank you, I'm so glad to be here. So can, can you share with us what inspired you to work on this film and how long did it take? Sure. Um, a friend of ours, a journalist, was writing a biography, a comprehensive biography of Muhammad Ali. Um, he reached out to us as far back as I think 2013 and suggested that we take this on as a documentary. And um, we poked around and discovered that while there were many terrific films done about chapters in his life or fights, um, individual fights, that there really wasn't anything that was comprehensive. And so this, around 2015, we sort of took it on in earnest. Um, we actually began filming uh, only a week after he had passed. And um, at the time we thought that maybe the folks that we had lined up for interviews might not want to uh, join us um, while they were grieving, but they did and they were excited to reminisce and to share their recollections about him. Um, so we're putting the finishing touches on it now. And um, so it'll be really about five years in the making. Wow, that's incredible. You know, as you researched for this film, what surprised you the most about Muhammad Ali? Well, um, interestingly, you know, as I began telling people that we were, that this is what we were up to, um, I would say, oh, you know, we're working on this comprehensive documentary about Muhammad Ali. 
Um, and then they would stop me and go, oh my goodness, I have this incredible story. When I was seven years old, he came to my town and I met him and uh, he signed an autograph for me and I have a snapshot and hold on, let me get it. And it was, you know, uh, on their bookshelf or somewhere nearby. And it was clear in every case that he left this indelible mark on everybody he encountered and everybody's enthusiasm for him was palpable. And this just happened over and over with everybody we talked about um, regarding the film. And so um, I sort of carried that with me throughout the production that his big heartedness and his generosity and the massive life that he lived, it, it was sort of reflected back in us by everybody he had encountered. And it seemed like he had encountered everybody. Um, I mean, literally billions of people saw him fight, but he also, he never shied away from a camera. He never shied away from an encounter with a fan. Um, he seemed to understand that it would be a moment they would speak about for the rest of their lives. And, um, and he loved the attention and um, he had such a big heart um, that his impact, he left that all over everybody who he ever encountered, even if it was only briefly. Well, thank you for that reflection. You know, as you prepare for the film to premiere, what part of the film are you more ex most excited for us to see? Hmm. Well, it's such a big life and there's so much to be excited about. I know people are familiar with chapters. They're familiar with particular fights, but I'm excited that everyone gets to see the whole span of his life um, and all the facets of it. Um, they can go on a spiritual journey with him. They can understand his close association with the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X. Um, they can understand the sacrifice he made in refusing induction into the army, what the costs were, um, how reviled he was for it. Um, and then this long climb back, he was stripped of his title, um, a white boxing press, a white establishment, the US government um, did whatever they could to knock him down. And he climbed back. Um, and by the time the Vietnam War was over and in the mid seventies, when he had been out with, been without this title for years, he won it again. And he won, had won everybody over by that point and become at that time, maybe the most famous man in the world. And I think in doing the comprehensive story, we can put all of that together and give everybody um, the whole arc of his life, um, his struggle with Parkinson's, um, an intimate look at his his family and his children. Um, it's all there under one roof, and um, I hope everybody will tune in uh, for the whole thing. Uh, we're very excited to share it. Well, we are so excited um, that you are sharing it, and we are happy that you joined us. So thank you so much for your time. We look forward to having more opportunities to speak with you about Ali in the coming months. PBS will actually be hosting national conversations to explore Ali's life prior to the film's release in the coming uh, months. And that would be June 23rd, July 19th, September 9th, and September 4th. The registration link right now will be placed in the chat uh, function and we look forward to seeing all of you and hoping you all will um, watch Ken Burns Muhammad Ali coming on September 19th. Thank you so much for joining us, David. So you are watching PBS Books and we are here celebrating the life and legacy of Muhammad Ali. Today's conversation highlights esteemed poet and writer Ishmael Reed who wrote, he's written many incredible works that he wrote in 2015, The Complete Muhammad Ali, which explores the American boxer and activist. Uh, the book really shares new material that had not previously um, been public and been published. To, to guide today's conversation, I am pleased to have Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Stephen Henderson. Henderson is the host of Detroit Public Television's American Black Journal, a weekly talk show featuring African-American perspectives on topics around arts, culture, and community issues important to the city of Detroit, the state of Michigan, and the nation. Henderson, is also the host of WDET's Detroit Today. Thank you, Stephen, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And it's uh, really wonderful to be here uh, to talk not only about Muhammad Ali, but about uh, Ishmael Reed's wonderful work uh, about Muhammad Ali. Um, I want to make sure that before we get started, uh, we talk a little about how this is going to work. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Ishmael Reed some questions. We're going to have a really interesting conversation about his book and about some of his other work. And then we're gonna turn it over to you, the viewers. We're gonna take uh, questions from the audience. And so if you have questions, if you have things that you wanna sort of bring up 
in the course of this conversation, all you have to do is put them in the chat window here, uh, and we will we will pick them out in a little bit. But let's first get to Ishmael Reed, uh, who is a poet, a novelist, an essayist, a playwright, a songwriter, a lecturer, and a publisher. That is quite a list uh, of achievements and jobs. Uh, he has won numerous prizes and grants in each of those categories, and he's also an illustrator and a jazz pianist. In 2019, he began his 36th year as a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. He also teaches at the California College of the Arts, where he is a distinguished professor. His most recent books, which were published by Baraka Books, are Why No Confederate Statues in Mexico, that's in 2019, uh, and The Terrible Force, which was just published this year in 2021. He also is the author of the forthcoming Bigotry on Broadway, and he lives in Oakland. Ishmael Reed, welcome to PBS Books. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Yeah, it's great mm. to be here. So uh, I, I want to start with just uh, an overview of this, this wonderful work uh, that you published in 2015, The Complete Muhammad Ali, uh, it, it's a story about Ali that takes a very different arc, I think, than most of the things that I've read or seen uh, about him. Uh, it, it is a very deliberate arc. Uh, let's start with you talking about why you wanted to tell this story and why you chose to tell it this way. Well, Stephen, I think that in this country, uh, the black story is told by others. And so black opinion and the black narrative is under a sort of like uh, uh, cultural occupation. And so I had to go to Montreal to get this book published. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was supposed to be published in the United States, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> um, I thought that uh, what I call the Ali scribes, I think mostly privileged white men who uh, control the story about Ali, had left out important uh, information. Uh, for example, uh, the, the great influence that the Nation of Islam uh, played upon his thinking. So for example, I think that uh, what uh, Muhammad Ali did was to follow the teachings of uh, Elijah Muhammad and sort of like, uh, I, don't, I don't wanna use the term like parroted or like, uh, sort, of like sort of like repeated the pronounces of Elijah Muhammad. This part of his story is left out, and uh, I think that the Nation of Islam uh, is dismissed by what I call the Ali scribes, the people who have a monopoly over that story, his story, uh, because, uh, it, it, because they considered the Nation of Islam to be uh, hate mongers. And, and let's talk about that relationship. Uh, I, I think uh, when you talk about Elijah Muhammad, you talk about the Nation of Islam, uh, in popular American culture, uh, the name that, that comes most to mind, of course, is, is Malcolm X, who uh, you know uh, is the most recognizable figure, uh, I think, in the Nation of Islam. And I think people know a little more about the relationship he had uh, with Elijah Muhammad than the one that uh, Ali had. But but catch us up on on what that relationship was was like, what it meant to Muhammad Ali. Uh, both in positive terms and sometimes in negative ones. Well, Marvin X, who's a black nationalist <clears throat> who actually knew uh, both uh, Ali and uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, talks about an incident where he went to Chicago to interview uh, Muhammad Ali. And uh, after conferring with the, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, uh, Ali uh, canceled the interview. So I think that what shows the influence that Elijah Muhammad had over Ali happened when he broke with Malcolm X. Uh, Malcolm X uh, became an international figure and uh, sort of like a television star. And uh, a friend of mine, one of the people I interviewed named Joe Walker, he and I ran a newspaper in Buffalo, New York, said that uh, when he worked for Muhammad Ali, uh, excuse me, Muhammad Speaks, Malcolm X hired him. The people in Chicago felt that he was favoring favoring uh, um, uh, Malcolm X over Elijah Muhammad. So Muhammad Ali was caught in that feud. And what he did, he chose to follow Elijah Muhammad. 
As a matter of fact, he mocked Malcolm X when they encountered each other in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so relate that relationship, I guess, uh, with Elijah Muhammad and with the Nation of Islam to the activism that we know uh, defined so much of uh, Ali's career. Uh, of course, you know, it's his personality uh, and his uh, strong independence and almost defiance that, that drives much of that. But uh, his allegiance to the Nation of Islam also helps frame some of that activism. Well, not participating in the war was policy. He was not the only follower of the Nation of Islam who took that position. As a matter of fact, Abdul Rahman, whom I interviewed, was the one who told him to tell the press, uh, no Vietnamese ever call me the N-word. I mean, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali was attracted to the Nation of Islam when he saw Abdul Rahman and others selling the newspaper in Florida. And there's a scene where uh, the, the the women are cooking for uh, uh, the people in the uh, who had gathered there. The press is outside, and uh, Abdul Rahman told me told me that he told uh, 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 Muhammad Ali not to uh, to to yield to the press demands that he take a position and tell the, tell them that uh, no Vietnamese ever called him that. Now he was instructed, or he was using the precedent set by Elijah Muhammad who also avoided the, Jap the war, World War II. They tried to get him for sedition first, then they got him for draft dodging, and he went to prison for five years. So he was following that precedent. Matter of fact, uh, the great historian Gerald Horn says there were more uh, pro-Japanese fronts among uh, Black people in the United States uh, than uh, communist fronts, and that uh, George Schuyler uh, and many others, Du Bois and others, celebrated the uh, Japanese victory over the uh, Russian Navy. In um, I, I want to talk about the voices that you incorporate in this book, which are different from uh, a lot of the voices that we've heard before talk mm -hmm. about uh, Muhammad Ali. Talk about the process of gathering those voices and how it helps you render the story uh, in a really different way. Well, you know, I went to, uh, <clears throat> I was approached by Shea Earhart, the great editor who was uh, Jacqueline Kennedy's editor, who asked me to write this book. So, and she was fired from Crown and the book, the manuscript is just laying around somewhere. Uh, they sent two people, two editors to, to sort of like uh, co-edit the book or whatever. And they disappeared from the scene. So the rights reverted to me. And I, I approached Robin Philpott. I had published Robin Phil, Philpott, who had run for parliament in Montreal. And so I approached him for publishing this book, and he published it right away. So I began the book in 2003, and I think it was published in 2015, 2015 or something like that. So it was, it was a long process. But I was able to interview people who were left out, voices that are left out. You know, I just got in, I got in a lot of trouble for writing a play called The Haunting of Lynn Manuel Miranda. That's what we do. We, we point to parts of history that are left out of American history. Look, look at Tulsa, what happened there, where we uncovered, you know, uh, an atrocity or genocide that, that occurred in 1921. So we do the left out stuff. And that led me to interviewing people whose voices uh, were not uh, heard. For example, I went to a uh, Black Nationalist book fair that was organized by uh, Marvin X in uh, San Francisco, interviewed Amiri Baraka and a number of other people uh, who uh, whose stories about uh, Ali are not told. Um, to talk about the um, let's talk about the personal Ali, the, mm -hmm. the 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 big personality that he had. Uh, you get into to who he is in this book uh, as a person in a way also that I. I haven't seen in other places. Well, Muhammad Ali never faced the uh, physical danger that Joe Lewis, uh, Sugar Ray Robinson, uh, Henry Armstrong, and Sonny Liston faced. I mean, these people are dismissed as uh, Uncle Tom's, Jackie Robinson, who court martial for striking an officer. Uh, Sugar Ray uh, Robinson and Joe Lewis beat up the MP, military police, in a bus station, in a segregated bus station because the police uh, 
jabbed his nightstick into Joe Lewis's side, and next thing you know, they were down. And it was a big fight, and it ended when somebody said, hey, that's Joe Lewis. <laughs> so Henry Armstrong beat up two, two policemen. Uh, Sonny Liston, a uh, policeman called him a VA N-word, and Sonny Liston put him in a trash can. After that, uh, there was a vendetta against Sonny Liston all over the United States, wherever he went, Denver, Philadelphia, all over. The police, there was a great bind the police had. The only place where he was safe was Las Vegas because uh, the police don't run Las Vegas. <laughs> Las Vegas. So um, uh, these people are dismissed as uh, Uncle Tom's when uh, Muhammad Ali never faced a kind of physical danger where you have actual physical combat with armed white men with authority that uh, they faced. Um, when you are uh, putting together a, a book like this and thinking about it uh, in, in terms that are really different um, uh, from, from others, you're not only thinking, I think, of words, but also of images. Um, and there are lots of images in this book, and some of them are images that people haven't seen before. Talk about, uh, talk about those images. Well, uh, <clears throat> there was a, one of the best uh, ph uh, photographers who followed uh, Muhammad Ali's uh, career was uh, Jose Puentes, a Puerto Rican uh, photographer. And uh, his uh, widow, the late uh, Jose Puentes, his widow allowed me to use these photographs, which were never published before. So you look at that cover, uh, most of the photos I've seen have shown a sort of like playful, mischievous, uh, you know, showman, Ali. Uh, this picture shows gloom because it was the day of the fight with uh, Leon Spinks, the second fight. And when I went to his uh, suite where the uh, his uh, aides were uh, gathered, I could feel the gloom that they thought that this uh, this would be his last fight or he might be, might be defeated. Uh, it might have been a good thing had he been defeated because he went on and fought uh, Larry Holmes. According to uh, Angelo Dundee, uh, Ali fought those last two fights with brain damage. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the fight with Larry Holmes, which it was a, a devastating punishment, a cruel punishment. And then he fought Trevor Burbick. And uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the trainers told me uh, that uh, 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 one of the Tommy Hearns was supposed to appear on Good Morning America to go a few rounds with uh, Ali, and Ali was so pitiful and, such, and it was such bad shape that he called it off. So that's that's the part that the Ali scribes are not going to talk about. Mm -hmm. Talk about his, uh, you know, refusing to, to uh, enter the war in Vietnam without giving the Nation of Islam credit for that policy. But they won't talk about the the sad and tragic uh, end of Ali's career. Yeah. You know, I wonder if there's a passage uh, that you'd like to read uh, for people from uh, the complete Muhammad Ali. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to surprise you. <laughs> okay. Because as I wrote this book, I began to uh, really sympathize with Sonny Liston. Hmm and feel that he'd gotten a raw deal. And, you know, when uh, uh, President Obama and others show that photo of Liston down on the canvas and Ali standing over him, I thought that was a class between the middle class and the underclass. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, everything I heard in Louisville was that uh, uh, Ali and his brother, Rachman, grew up under very... No, you know, comfortable circumstances. Yeah. Suddenly, this was just sort of thrown into the world. He had to survive with all his children, his siblings. His uh, father beat him every day. And when he went to uh, live with his mother, she wanted to know why he showed up. <laughs> so he was not wanted. And so I just want to read a passage here. After the fight with Ali, Liston was never again given the opportunity to fight for the championship, but continued to bust up some contenders. 
His reputation was destroyed by sports writers and commentators who, then as now, believe that they know more about boxing than the fighters. This includes those who broadcast Floyd Mayweather's second fight. I would say that Floyd May Mayweather is pound for pound the best fighter in history. <clears throat> second fight with uh, Marcos Madonna. They said that Mayweather had been helped in his defeat of Madonna with the aid of the referee. They also disputed Mayweather's claim that he'd been bitten by Madonna. How, they asked, could he have been bitten when he was wearing gloves? Pauli Maglanani, Mag Maglanagi had to explain to them that he had been bitten by a boxer while wearing gloves and it hurt. Similarly, while sports writers who have never entered the ring, like jazz critics who fake it, accuse Liston of being in on the fix after that second uh, fight where he went down with the phantom, the so called phantom punch, three champions. Rocky Marciano, Jose Torres, and James Braddock, the Cinderella man, said it was a legitimate punch that knocked Liston down. They say that for an aging champion, and Liston might have been 40 when he fought Ali, power is the last asset to go. So it was with Liston. His last fight was with Chuck Wepner. Now, this was three months before he was murdered, whose knockdown of Ali was the basis of the Rocky films. Liston beat him so badly that Wepner, Wepner said, was to say that every time he hit me in the face, he broke something. Liston received $13,000 for that fight. He was supposed to have received $15,000. So was Liston an animal? Liston had a dry wit and a shrewd intelligence. He loved children. And there's an account that the mob frightened Liston Threatening to kidnap one, Biden, frightened Liston by threatening to kidnap one of his children if he didn't take a dive. He gave money to charity. It was known to do good works. Most of those who knew him vouched for his good character and his intelligence. A few uh, mentioned his witty replies to Ali's verbal jabs. In the hundred or so worshipful books about Muhammad Ali, they feature his clever goading of Liston, which got Liston so angry that he fought a clumsy fight with Ali. And I'll conclude with another paragraph. At any rate, this is after Liston died. At any rate, thousands left their gambling tables and scoreboards to witness the Liston funeral procession pass through the Las Vegas Strip. Among the celebrities were Ed, Ed Sullivan, Doris Day, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Jackie Leonard, Jerry Vale, and Rosie Greer. Many were in tears because deep down they probably knew that Sonny Liston, born into poverty and without schooling, called by Joe Lewis the greatest heavyweight champion, had been dealt a bad hand. He said that he was treated like a sewer rat. But while Ali was hailed as a hero for the middle class to stand against an unpopular war, Liston represented the underclass that President Obama and the Harvard Circle disdain. He was one of 24 children and was born in a condition of slavery without the name. His father beat him. He traveled to St. Louis to be with his mother, who instead of giving him an affectionate greeting, wanted to know why he showed up. Having no education, he, like other members of his class, committed petty high-risk crimes. An armed robbery landed him in prison. He got into trouble with the law and sports writers like Larry Merchant after he defended himself against a drunken armed cop who lied about the incident, as some cops regularly do. His wife, Geraldine, was correct when she called him the champ that nobody wanted. So, so uh, you know, as much as this book is about Muhammad Ali and his journey, you know, it's about America and it's about uh, Black America. Um, and it's about Black America's place and relationship with, uh, with white America. Well, what lessons do you think we should be drawing from this story uh, right now as, uh, as we're having really intense conversations uh, about some of the very same dynamics that surrounded uh, Muhammad Ali when, when he was young, uh, 
when he was an activist, uh, when he was a fighter. Uh, what should we be learning from this? Well, you know, it was a consensus among the black, uh, those black uh, people that I interviewed that uh, America began to love him when he was, when he was uh, ill and near death and his health was deteriorating. deteriorating. Uh, that's when all this affection started pouring out. And you have to give uh, credit to uh, his wife, Yolanda, who was a shrewd businesswoman. And according to what I heard in uh, Louisville and read, he was near death. After that Larry Holmes fight, he was uh, broke. And she had a crush on him ever since she was a child. And when she married him, she got his affairs in order. She uh, brought around, brought, uh, brought about a $50 million deal for him, use of his name. I mean, once in a while, you'll see Ali in these commercials. Now, that's because of her, her, her shrewd business sense. So I think Yolanda is the one who uh, have him, had him live his life, uh, the rest of his life in comfort and at, at peace. But I think that uh, uh, the black people I interviewed are very skepti skeptical of this uh, outpouring of affection. They feel that he was no longer the Louisville lip. You know, he was feeble, and that's when they loved him. They love you when you're down and out and when you're dead. <laughs> so uh, beyond being an accomplished novelist, I know you're also a poet, essayist, a lecturer, and uh, a songwriter. So I always wonder with writers um, uh, how the other things they do inform the work? How does being a, a, a poet, for instance, or a songwriter uh, help you or shape the way uh, you write a novel uh, or write a book, uh, you know, a biography of someone like Muhammad Ali? Well, I was traveling with a, a, a band called Conjure, and you can get their records on uh, Amazon, Conjure 1, Conjure 2, Conjure 3, who set my uh, work uh, to uh, music. For example, Alan Toussaint and Carlo Blay and a number, uh, Taj Mahal. Uh, I've written songs for uh, uh, Cassandra Wilson. Macy Gray did my song. So uh, all these things are related. And uh, I took up some playwriting. I've written about nine plays. And my new play is called The Slave Who Loved Caviar. <laughs> you, can see a reading, you can see a reading of it on YouTube, the just go to the slave who loved caviar, in which I play Dracula's son. And the play is about the exploitation of uh, uh, Jean uh, Michel Basquiat, who died at 28 and who was destroyed by the downtown art crowd, racist downtown art crowd. crowd. And uh, in December, that play is opening at the uh, Theater for the New City off Broadway in December. It'll be running there for a month. But right, right now you can see uh, a reading of the play uh, at YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I play uh, Kim, I, you know, uh, the great, the great uh, fashion designer, Grace Wales Bonner uh, flew me to London and I played the piano to back up her fashion show. And Naomi Campbell took an Instagram of my playing the piano in the fashion show. And I said, I can die now. <laughs> anyway, I have a lot of fun writing. I love it. <laughs> so you are with PBS Books, and we're here with Ishmael Reed discussing the complete Muhammad Ali and his other work. Just a reminder that if you want to participate in this uh, conversation, uh, you can enter any questions you have or any comments you have in the chat. And we are reviewing those questions, uh, and we'll answer them toward, uh, toward the end of the program. Uh, I, I wonder, Ishmael, if you can talk about the last year, which has been, I think, uh, you know, unlike any other year that any of us alive uh, have experienced. Uh, it has been especially hard, I think, uh, on artists uh, and, and writers. You know, tragedy affects, I think, the creative process in a, in a really different way. Uh, it's also been really brutal on the African-American uh, community. Um, uh, talk about what has changed in your life uh, in the last year, and what has it inspired you to be working on? Well, I think I think that uh, I wrote a, a book called uh, "Why No Confederate uh, Flags and uh, Why No Confederate Statues." Excuse me, "Why No Confederate Statues in Mexico." And I talk about the uh, 
criminal and genocidal behavior of these people that we feel uh, build statues to, uh, Stonewall Jackson, uh, Jefferson Davis and all of them. You know, they killed thousands of people before they got us into a war that uh, cost 600,000 American lives. As a matter of fact, Ken Burns, whom you mentioned earlier, they mentioned earlier, said that uh, these guys cost more uh, lives in war than uh, so-called Tojo, the Japanese. So I did a little research and went back to the origins of their uh, fanat their homicidal fanaticism and found that uh, they killed uh, thousands of Native Americans. And then they went into Mexico and uh, killed uh, you know thousands of unarmed people, that same crew, all these Confederate generals. And uh, I talk about one battle where they uh, sought to overcome uh, a citadel where some uh, Mexican uh, cadets uh, were holding, uh, holding forth. And Robert E. Lee was an engineer. As a matter of fact, uh, his generals say he was, he blundered the war, lost the war, because actually he was an engineer more than a general. He's more of an engineer. He, uh, he designed the bombardment of, this bombardment of this castle. And so when they uh, conquered uh, the Mexican army that was holding the castle, uh, six, uh, six uh, cadets from 16 to, uh, let's see, from 12 or six to 16, refused to surrender. And they're called Los Ninos in Mexico and they're statues to them. And one of them uh, hurled himself from the, the, the wall of the castle, embracing the Mexican flag. These are heroes uh, in uh, Mexico. One more thing. Uh, there was an army, a battalion, St. Patrick's Battalion. And uh, it was made of fugitive slaves, uh, immigrants, Irish Americans and others. And the, the the measures that were taken, the war measures taken against the Mexicans were so vicious and evil that they defected to the other side and they were hanged. So these are stories that we don't get. Now, as for this year, I think uh, they want to take us back to uh, the, the 1860s when uh, white supremacy reigned. And I think their model is probably these generals like uh, Robert E. Lee and uh, Jefferson Davis and others. And I think uh, McKellen, um, the senator, uh, the minority leader in the Senate is sort of like doing more for the Confederacy than all these generals put together. He's practiced nullification against uh, Barack Obama. And now he's doing it again. Now, this is not the party of Trump. This is the party of John Wilkes Booth. Mm -hmm. Because John Wilkes Booth was in the audience when Lincoln said he wanted black people to vote. And he was overheard saying, I'm going to kill him now. So this is the part of John Wilkes Booth. They want to take away the franchise from black people, and they believe assassination, like Booth, they believe assassination is the way to do it. Like they went in there and threatened to hang the vice president. They want to hang. Uh, they had a scaffold outside. So uh, in the end, they can't, they can't win because white nationalism is dead. This will never be a white country, never has been, and will, ne will never be. So they're, they're, they're going to lose, but a lot of people are going to die mm -hmm. in the process. Hmm. So, so uh, back to, to Ali, do you see anyone now um, who kind of embodies the, the spirit and the legacy of the kind of activism uh, that Muhammad Ali in, in embraced and, and practiced in his life? Who, who, who would that be? I think, uh, LeBron, I think uh, LeBron James has gone beyond him. Hmm. I think some of the basketball players have, have done much more in, uh, with philanthropy. I mean, Ali was good at giving individuals gifts, like when he was in, in Manila. And I got that point of view. I, I, I interviewed Emil Guillermo, who said the thriller in Manila brought the Philippines into the 20th century. Mm. Before that, they were regarded as the little brown ones. But that fight gave Philip, the Philippines international recognition. But uh, uh, I, I think that... Uh, 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 that that uh, fight and uh, some of the other uh, incidents of uh, generosity where he gave some guy in the Philippines, a, I mean, a, a mother and her, this, this is how it went, a mother and her child went to headquarters. And I think uh, Ali gave them $25,000 because they said they needed money. So he was into individual philanthropy. But LeBron and uh, Stephen Curry and some of the other basketball players have uh, created organizations 
And I, I wrote a book about black philanthropy. Not a book, excuse me, an article. I write so I, some guy called me the Lord of writing too much. But I wrote an article about black philanthropy. And blacks do do give, they give more than other ethnic groups. And I think this is increasing. So I think that needs to show in the way in terms of philanthropy. Yeah. So so what's next? What's next for you? Uh, you're you have such a busy mind, such an active mind. Uh, where is it headed now? Well, you know, I think that uh, I'm going to go out on my shield. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean uh, uh, I, you know, I got I got that people say attribute this uh, phrase to me. Right in this fighting, <laughs> I got that from Ali. <laughs> I keep telling these people. I said that's not. That's not anything original with me. When uh, Charlie Harris and others got uh, Ali to sign a contract, or Richard Durman, her Durham, wrote mm-hmm. one of the best books, the greatest, on Ali. Uh, they asked him how he was going to write a book, and he said, "Writing is fighting." <laughs> and that's been one of the few weapons. You know that one yeah. of the few weapons available to us. The way yeah. we can look back. And a number of our poets, like Paul Lawrence Dunbar, had a newspaper, the, Date, the uh, Dayton Tatler, which, interesting, interesting enough, was uh, supported by the Wright brothers, his newspaper. Uh, George Schuyler, Langston Hughes, you know, some of our great writers, John A. Williams, who wrote for Newsweek, have been uh, journalists. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And uh, now I'd like to invite Heather from PBS Books to join us for the question and answer segment of this conversation. Heather? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, this has been a great conversation, and I'm looking forward for us to continue it. So we're going to start the Q&A. Our first question actually comes from someone who is live, who is with us. Um, and she is a writer and a poet, Tennessee Reed, Ishmael Reed's daughter. Before you share your, quest- your question with us, Tennessee, I was hoping you could share a little bit about yourself, about your creative process and your work. I recently had a book published entitled Calafia Burning. I worked on that book for about eight years. My creative process is very different than most people's. Me, it whatever comes to my mind, I just write about it. First, it becomes into journal format and then eventually becomes a poem. Actually, I write a lot about animals and nature. That's one of my big big subjects. Also politics and travel and other things that come to my mind. My master's thesis was actually about animals. And right now, since that book has been published, I've been working on a poetry journal about my low back problems, starting from the diagnosis up to uh, the recent spinal fusion surgery that I had and into the recovery period. So I'm currently working on that. Well, one of the reasons I was so thrilled that you could join us is I think creatives and especially you, Tennessee, who who obviously has, you've had an intimate relationship with your father would be able to ask some really tough questions. Um, and we were hoping that you could start us off with the Q&A by asking one of those tough questions that you know would provide more insight for all of us. Okay, Mr. Reed. When did you first notice Muhammad Ali? Yes, uh, well, I went to a uh, I went to a poetry reading at a place called the Bitter Inn. It was a cafe in uh, Greenwich Village, and he read with a poet named Diane Wachowski, who's a very famous poet. And I saw him, you know, driving up with his entourage, and uh, he's very curious. He looked around, looked at the crowd, and looked uh, looked the place up and down, and uh, I understand he acquitted him very. Uh, he acquitted himself very well as a poet, and then I went to uh, see him fight Doug Jones. Doug Jones won that fight, and it occurred to me that this was how television was going to work. Television was going to seek the most glamorous and outspoken, attention-getting boxers to promote, and that's come down to us to the present day, where Golden Boy and uh, the other promoters uh, choose, uh, you know, fighters who uh, who have a tel- who are telegenic and whoever br- bringing uh, bringing crowds. So I think that's the way he struck me. But I mean, he fought a lot of uh, he fought a lot of great fights. He was very fast, 
But when he lost his speed, he got started to get hit. Ron Lyle said that you could hit him. You, before that draft thing where he was off for a few years, uh, you know, you, you couldn't touch him. Look at some of the fights. He had the speed. But when he slowed down, they, they began to hit him, just like Roy Jones. When Roy Jones slowed down, he got hit. And then I, then I saw him in 1978 where I covered the fight for the Village Voice, and he was uh, uh, he was on a decline, very much on a decline then. Tennessee, do you have another question as well? Uh, did you ever meet him? Yeah, I met him in I met him in 1978 when I covered the fight for the Village Voice. I was walking, I opened the door, and he was standing there. It was a real surprise. He was standing there with uh, his uh, third wife and uh, Bronica, and I found myself saying, "The greatest man in the world." I mean, just, I, I interviewed the South African uh, singer before he died, uh, Hugh Masekela, and he said, we were unreasonable about Ali, and he's right about that. But he, we would, he was a figure of law to us. I mean, they let him beat up Superman in the comic books. So um, he, he was that uh, awe-inspiring, a huge fellow with, uh, he said, good looks. Of course, he denied his uh, so-called white blood, but then Toward the end of his life, he went to Ireland and met, uh, you know, his uh, his uh, great great grandfather Abraham Grady. He met uh, his relatives over there, and thousands of people of uh, turned out to see him. It wasn't covered by the American uh, press. I, I I think I found it in the Irish news, but he began to uh, become more universal. I guess you might say that, where Buddhists were saying his name. And I think uh, toward the end of, his, end of his life, he became what he accused Malcolm of becoming, a holy man. Okay, we're going to go to some audience questions now. Um, Edward, uh, or Edwin, uh, asks, how did Ali's six core principles come to be? Where did that come from? Well, you know, I think uh, I don't want to bring Freud, I, I don't want, I don't want to bring Freud into this, but his father was a uh, uh, a sign painter, and he did uh, paintings of Jesus and the uh, you know the apostles in these churches. So when he revolted against uh, Christianity, it might have been some kind of Freudian thing. I don't know, but his his father uh, really sort of like. Uh, supported the family and they were comfortable. But he began to question things that we questioned, like why why was Santa Claus white? Why was Jesus a white? Why are all these uh, icons white? We didn't see anything black. When I went to school, I took uh, a book, uh, when I was going to grammar school, I took a book by J.A. Rogers, 100 Facts About the Negro, and the teacher dismissed it, said it was, it was nonsense. So we had no history. And one of the things that Malcolm X and others did was to uh, popularize uh, black history. They didn't invent it. There were others before, scholars before them, but they popularized it. And so uh, Muhammad Ali had the same questions that we had. And I think for him, the Nation of Islam uh, answered these questions for him. These are very well-read people. Now, Elijah Muhammad had very little education, but he, let a, he read about 100 books in the Library of Congress. So uh, if you look at uh, the Black Panthers and the nation, you look at their children, they're very articulate. I went, uh, I heard uh, they did Huey Newton's funeral. Here was like a, a, a seminar or something. So many people had their doctorates and stuff. So I think that's, that, was a, that was a threat that uh, that generation uh, posed to the establishment because not only would they fight you back, they're very smart. As a matter of fact, in Detroit, and you know, you know Stephen, that in Detroit, uh, you know, the the uh, the uh, uh, members of the Nation of Islam used to fight the police in court, in the courthouse, for just re disrespecting Black women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, have, we haven't seen people like that before. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got another uh, audience question. Uh, Gordon asks, how would Ali have done against Joe Lewis? That's a really interesting, uh, <laughs> that's a really interesting question. What do you beat him? Well, you know, that. 
I asked some some old old timers in the shoe shine shop or shoe shoe repair store about that, and they had a big fight about it. But I think uh, Ali had more weapons than uh, Lewis, and he talked about Lewis fighting like a mummy. You remember the mummy in the in the movies? Like I, he called uh, Joe Lewis the mummy. He had nicknames for the boxers. But I think that uh, Ali just had more more technique. Uh, than Lewis, but Lewis, if he caught up with you, he'd knock you out. Like, you know, he said, you could run, but you can't hide. <laughs> That's what I say to these people putting out these bad stories about black people. You can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> Lewis, Miranda, you can't hide. Yeah. You know, I, I, I also wonder if, um, you know, given uh, the things that are happening now, given what you see in sports, given the activism you see among uh, uh, sports figures and the conversations that we're having now, are you hopeful? About um, about the future, are you hopeful that uh, that justice and equality will play a bigger role uh, in America sometime soon, or do you think uh, this is maybe just kind of an episodic um, uh, chapter in in a, a much longer story? No, I think it's it's uh, up to ordinary people. I just this thing on Facebook. I ought to stay away from Facebook. I spend too much time on it. But I was looking at the uh, mother of this policeman who was slain in, uh, when these, these thugs, when these thugs uh, try to overthrow the government. You know, as a matter of fact, they were white collar people with sick, uh, sick leave and pensions and everything. They weren't like cast aside, which is the media's thing about their being cast aside and forgotten. No, these are CEOs and one of them arrived on a private plane. But I saw her on television and I said, when History touches ordinary people. They respond with eloquence. Look at uh, 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 George Floyd's uh, brother, how he's responding. History, so ordinary people will get us through this. People like Fannie Lou Hammer, that kind of pe- that kind of person, or um, Attorney General's uh, the Attorney General Mitchell's uh, wife. Remember Martha Mitchell? She said Nixon was wrong. She said Nixon was behind the whole thing. And I remember when. They put a wreath on her grave. One of the wreaths said, Martha was right. As long as we have individuals like this, we don't have to worry about uh, these creeps. Matter of fact, I got a poem coming out about these people in the North American Review very shortly, where I expressed my disdain for these people, comparing their, comparing what they did to 1776. Mm-hmm. Everybody they hate fought in that war. In the Revolutionary War, black people fought in there, so these guys can go around and put nooses, Hank, in workplaces. Black people calling President Obama a pimp and his wife a prostitute and everything. Black people fought at Valley Forge. They left their bloody footprints in the snow at Valley Forge. They don't like Jews. Those Jewish financiers financed the Revolutionary War. One was arrested by the British. They don't like immigrants. Immigrants fought in the Revolutionary War. These are Fox News patriots. These are sunshine patriots, you know? They go to Washington, get in these four-star hotels, go show their behinds at the at the Capitol, then get back to their hotels in time for happy hour. <laughs> you know, I also wonder, you, you spend a lot of your time uh, as a professor with young people. Um, mm-hmm. I'm always curious uh, what you hear from young people right now, especially after the year we just had and all the disruption that they've experienced. Uh, are you hopeful about what you're hearing from them about uh, America and the future? Well, I, th- I think uh, they, they're probably uh, less walled off from uh, other groups than uh, we were. You know, I grew up in segregated uh, the projects and uh, <clears throat> that was my life, that was our life. And incidentally, uh, so I didn't really realize how segregated my life was until uh, my partner, who helped, me, uh, who was a co-author of uh, Bigotry on Broadway, we went back to my hometown because she was uh, writing a book about uh, Mary uh, Bethune, who was the first uh, woman who be licensed to be licensed as an architect, and she built the Lafayette Hotel in Buffalo, New York, in about the 1900s. And I went into certain neighborhoods, and I was like. Uh, I was elected to get out of the car because the old days you walk in those neighborhoods, you can be beaten up and called by the N word and everything. So I think uh, that uh, the younger people have a different perspective than we have because uh, 
they've been uh, exposed to the social media and have uh, global interactions, which we didn't have. Now, now the people, the good old boys who dominate the column pages of the New York Times, who sound like uh, QAnon, although they went to Harvard, they got a better vocabulary. They're all upset about wokeness and they're upset about cancel culture. Nobody's canceling them. So, I mean, these, they don't, they do not have the perspective with their, you know, narrow Eurocentric educations that these are, these young people have. Well, we are at the top of the hour and we need to close conversation. Um, but I wanted to just thank Ishmael for your book, for your tremendous insights, for your, your amazing research and for sharing it tonight with us and your creativity. Um, it's, you feel so honored that, um, that you are among us. Um, I want to thank Tennessee because I, I really enjoyed meeting her and having her questions and having her on the live stream. And then I, I wanted to thank Stephen for guiding this incredible conversation. Um, it's been such an honor to have you. Um, from PBS Books, we are so appreciative that you joined this evening. And until next time, we thank you.